And you know, you say you feel her pain, but I'm not your father. You don't have to deal with me at home. Right, Alana? Uh-huh. Uh <laughs> All right. When I was 16, believe it or not, a long time ago, believe it or not, I had a girlfriend. I know it's hard to believe, but it was true. She was a theater kid. And you know, those theater kids, they accepted anybody. If you're familiar with your high school cliques. I was a rocker kid who wasn't wild enough to hang with the real rocker kids. I was horribly introverted and shy, not to mention chronically depressed. I ended up falling in with the kids who were into theater and choir, music. Last week, I was actually having a conversation with someone about how those kids and those programs in school may have saved my life, which is why it's so important to support the arts in school. Because giving sensitive kids creative outlets is life-giving. But I digress. Let's just say that at 16 years old, I found myself with hair halfway down my back and wearing a Nirvana t-shirt, playing guitar for theater productions of Godspell, Man of La Mancha, and the roar of the grease paint and the smell of the crowd, and others. I also found myself attending professional performances of musicals like Rent and Jesus Christ Superstar. One show that really caught my attention and I soon found myself addicted to that soundtrack, and that was Les Miserables. Or if you're, gonna, if you're French, you might pronounce it a little bit differently than that, uh, because I'm really bad at French. But it's based on the classic book by Victor Hugo, which was published in 1862. Here's a copy of it. Uh, it features everything from romance to war to justice, and a powerful story of redemption. It's been made into several movies now, some of them in the musical form, some of them without the music. Uh, this week I decided it was time for me to actually sit down and read the novel, a quaint piece of light reading at a mere 1,200 pages. <laughs> I haven't finished it yet, but I did come to one of the parts of the book that has fascinated me for almost 30 years now. Jean Valjean, the main character of the story, starts out life as a peasant agricultural worker, a tree trimmer, something like the prophet Amos that we've talked about in recently. He's a simple person, intelligent and mostly kind, but illiterate and struggling to make a living as many peasants were. The fact is even more true when he becomes the breadwinner for his sister's family after her husband dies very young, leaving her with seven children to raise. That's a lot of mouths to feed, and they often went to bed hungry. At some point during the off-season, when he was having difficulty finding work, Valjean could take no more of watching the kids starve. So, in desperation, he breaks a window in the local baker's establishment and steals one loaf of bread to feed the children. He's ultimately caught. And at that time in France's history, the heavy arm of justice was heavy indeed, with very harsh penalties. He was sentenced to five years of hard all for a loaf of bread to feed starving children. During this time, he tries to escape his inhumane situation more than once, and that adds, adds time to his sentence and eventually paroled after 19 years of very hard labor at somewhere around 50 years of age. If that seems a little harsh to you, let me remind you that many would say the same thing of our own penal system, especially when it comes to things like the war on drugs. We have lots of people crowding our prison systems on trumped up charges that are related to drug charges when they likely deserve treatment rather than punishment, but unfortunately we have more beds in prison than we do in treatment centers. 
Les Miserables is a work of fiction, but stories often portray reality far better than any book of history, because art often imitates life better than life itself. Valjean's situation is not new in human history, nor is it a story of bygone past. When he's paroled, even in his first days, he is a victim of severe stigmatization. He spends a few days in the local villages looking for work and lodging. Word spreads fast, and the rumors of a wandering convict reach the town before he can. And even though he has money to pay, he has refused food or a bed at any of the local inns. Nobody would give him work, either. Sound familiar? He'd spent years under the yoke of an oppressive system, first in poverty, then in shackles. Then during the time he had become a man soured under the weight of an unforgiving society. He'd become bitter, angry, resentful of a country that had forgotten him, hated him, and used him. He had no more use for society, and society had no more use for him. He had been made into a criminal, and a criminal he now shall be. This experience under his newfound freedom just solidified his station in life. He had given up. He had lost hope. Finally, with the help of a kindly woman who apparently hadn't gotten the word of his arrival in town, Valjean is directed to a small house in town, which was the home of the bishop. He knocks on the door, and to his surprise, he's welcomed inside to share a meal and is given a bed for the night with no questions asked. The kindly bishop, who he doesn't realize is a bishop but does realize is a priest, had made it his life's work to, heal the, to help the poor to, and kept very few luxuries for himself, one of which was the silverware that he used to dine in the evening. Valjean notices the silver and how much money he could get from selling that silver on the street. And in the, second, in the middle of the night, he comes to commit his second crime, stealing the silver and escaping in the night from the bed that he was given for free. He had accepted his fate as a criminal and then stole from the only person who had shown him kindness in the past 20 years. The reader is only somewhat surprised by this because it had been made clear by the writer that Valjean had given up on all hope. And when we lose hope, we lose ourselves. He had renounced God and humidity, huma humanity. In Florida, we do want to renounce the humidity. Uh, he had renounced God and humanity, and he was indeed lost. Anyway... He doesn't make it far after he escapes in the night. And early the next morning, as soon as the bishop's household finds the silver missing, there's a knock at the door. The town guard had caught Valjean in the street and discovered the silver on him. They asked Valjean about it, and he says the priest had given it to him, which was obviously a lie. The guards saw that as a lie, and they brought him to the bishop's house to inquire about this. They stand before the bishop and say, this man has claimed that you gave him this silver. To everyone's bewilderment, the bishop replies, yes, that's right. I gave him the silver. Everyone, the guards, Valjean himself, stand there gaping. You gave him the silver? He's telling the truth? The guard asked, bewildered, that's right. And then he says, but you forgot these too. And he hands Valjean two silver candlesticks, the last of the valuable things in the home. And with a final word from the bishop, Valjean stands there with his jaw dropping, obviously. And the bishop says, remember, that you promised to take all this silver and to use it to become an honest man. 
With that, Valjean is released and returns convicted, this time not of a crime, but of his own brokenness. This act of mercy and faith by the bishop is what kickstarts the redemption of Jean Valjean, which is the major theme of this story. Can we change? That's the question that Victor Hugo is trying to ask in this book. Can we change? Can we cash in the warranty on our lives and become someone new? Or are we just the sum of our experiences, destined to become whatever life has molded us to be? That's the question he's asking in writing this book. And I'll read a little bit, just one paragraph from it. Don't worry, not the whole book. And Hugo says, Can human nature be ever wholly and radically transformed? Can the man whom God made good to be made wicked, excuse me, can the man whom God made good be made wicked by man? Can the soul be reshaped in its entirety by destiny and made evil because destiny is evil? Can the heart become misshapen? and afflicted with ugly, incurable deformities under disproportionate misfortune, like a spinal column bent beneath a too low roof? Is there not in every human soul, and was there not in the soul of Jean Valjean, an essential spark, an element of the divine, indestructible in this world and immortal in the next, which goodness can preserve, nourish, and fan into glorious flame, in which evil can never quite extinguish. You'll have to read the book to see what happens. I'm sure you'll all be rushing out to buy it. But suffice it to say that yes, Jean Valjean is sparked into his full potential by this act of kindness. This is what Paul is talking about in his letter to the Ephesians when he says to put off your old self like taking off a piece of clothing and to put on the new self. Like the new outfit will make a new person. We are more than the hand that life has dealt to us. So much more. Like when we call in the warranty on a faulty dishwasher and get a new one, we can be made new again. Although that phrase is kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? New again. Can we be made new twice? Are we really new if we're made new again? New means new. You can't be made new again. Notice what Paul says, clothe yourself with the new self, created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. You see, our new clothes are really just our original clothes. It's our true birthday suit, the image of God. Although we may lose track of that original outfit, it never loses us. No matter how full our baggage is, the image of God is always packed somewhere in there. It's never lost. We may get beat up by life, stand accused of crimes, the light of our life snuffed away. In fact, I know another story of someone who was beat up, stood accused of crimes, and whose life was snuffed out. His name was Jesus Christ. And like him, we can be resurrected into new life, somehow more perfect by our sufferings in life. I don't intend to imply that suffering is somehow holy. I don't think God desires our suffering in any way at all. But I do mean to say that suffering is nothing compared to the redemptive power that Christ showed us. And that we can be made whole again, new again. Sometimes I disagree with Christian traditions that talk about being born again as if it's a one-time thing in life, occurring when we accept Jesus Christ into our, into our heart or get baptized or say some specific prayer. We have the potential to become new every day. And so do those people who we encounter in the world. 
That's what it means to walk humbly with God. To know that we are not bound by our, by our earthly experiences alone, but we are always bound tightly to the image of God within us. We must be resurrected every day to hold that image. We have to put on new clothes every day because the pain of this world holds us tight. The biggest boundary to that old new self is the loss of hope, as Jean Valjean had lost his hope. To love mercy is to show mercy to others. Like the Bishop Monseigneur Muriel did to Jean Valjean. Mercy will give hope, which can robe us in the image of God that we are meant to wear. Keep showing mercy and spreading hope, because that is the gospel. Amen.